Okay, hello everybody. Let's get started. Uh, let's see, so if you can hear me, somebody type a chat message, give me a shout out. Great, thank you. And how about the, the, the whiteboard? Can you see the whiteboard with the digital circuit slide on it? Great, thank you. Um, so at, at any time, if I sound you know, really muted or you can't hear me, let me know. Um, I, I had this happen on a Zoom call the other day. It seems my microphone had switched over to my camera and it was hard to hear me. So uh, if I get hard to hear, let me know. Or if I'm describing something and it looks like the video doesn't match, let me know and I will get that fixed. So let's start with a few announcements. Um, I put I posted on Canvas information about exam two. So exam two is going to be uh, posted on Canvas on Friday, April 3rd, 4 p.m. And then uh, work the exam anytime between 4 p.m. and submit your answers by Monday uh, for 6, April 6th at 5 p.m. So you'll have uh, you know, a few days to work that exam. And then I'm also going to ask you to submit your notes via Canvas. So you're going to upload your, not your notes, but your, your work for your exam. So be sure to be sure to write something to, uh, to justify all of your numeric answers, I'll say. You don't have to justify uh, circling a multiple choice question, but uh, if you want to, you can, if you want to explain something, but um, definitely submit work for your numeric answers so we can see what you did and give you full credit or give you partial credit if the answer is wrong and you, um, and, and if the answer's wrong and you did some work to support that answer. So someone asked, uh, the exam isn't timed. So it is not timed. In other words, you have all of that time from 4 p.m. on Friday to Monday, uh, uh, 5 p.m. So you just download the exam Friday. You have all weekend to work it if you want. Uh, the, the time limit is several days. The exam itself is going to be, uh, it, it's just designed to be a one hour exam. So it's not going to take you all weekend to work this. Um, if you have any questions, definitely shoot me an email. I'll answer as I can, but I don't think you'll have any time restriction on this. It'll be open book, open notes. Take a look at that announcement that went out on Canvas and shoot me an email or, or uh, stay after class uh, on Zoom for office hours if you want to talk about that. Okay, labs. So labs are moving to LT Spice. Um, the first simulation lab is posted, and there will be no more labs, no more pre-labs uh, like we were doing, so just uh, work those simulation labs. I think they're going to be really good experience to see how to simulate circuits. So there's a, there's a lab, Swarupa posted a lab and also a video, so you should be able to find a video online uh, linked there. If you can't find that lab or video, shoot an email to Swarupa and she'll get you hooked up with that. Um, so Monday's lecture, I'll get posted tonight. I had a problem with uh, converting that, so I'm going to get that up on the uh, linked on Canvas tonight. Let's see, and office hours, I'll hold those after class, so stick around if you want to ask questions or if you just want to uh, l listen to answers from other people's questions. And as always, uh, ask questions during this lecture. And uh, what I recommend is shoot me a chat. And if I don't see your chat within a you know a minute or so, um, or if I change topics, definitely unmute and uh, ask the question. Otherwise, please stay muted to keep the background noise uh, at a minimum for for our tens of people joining. Okay, so before I start the material, any questions? Uh, generally about class. Okay, so let's get started. I didn't see any questions. Let's let's get started with the uh, digital material. So last time we talked about binary number systems. We talked about uh, hexadecimal number systems, and 
we talked about converting between decimal, which we're used to, base 10, and binary, base 2, and hex, base 16. And, and uh, we talked about how to convert between binary and hex using four bit words, uh, so let's see, starting at the radix and then moving either side of the radix. And so that also showed a way to represent longer binary numbers with fewer digits with hex. So that's kind of a little introduction to how computers and digital electronics operate with, uh, with number systems. Uh, then we moved on to combinatorial logic. So I gave a quick explanation of combinatorial logic, which was, um, so you have a circuit and it has inputs and those inputs are logical inputs, right? They're zeros or ones, they could be binary inputs, uh, or logical, false or true, no or yes. Um, and so you might have many inputs into a circuit and you get an output, usually one output, but you get an output and that circuit makes a decision based on those present inputs, those current inputs. So, so there's no memory in the circuit. It doesn't remember what happened a few minutes ago. It operates on current, I should say present, present inputs and it produces an output almost instantaneously. So so let's jump back into this. I started out with an OR gate last, uh, an OR gate, yeah, last time. Let me just redraw that really quickly. So the OR gate, look like this. This is a two input OR gate. And it has logical variables written next to the input and next to the output. So these are the inputs. A and B are inputs. C is an output. And so they're logical variables. Uh, they're zeros or ones, or true or false. And we know we can map those to voltages. For example, if this is five volt logic, a could be zero volts nominally or five volts nominally, signifying zero or one. And the same thing for B and then C, the output would be the same thing. If you want, if this gate decided it should have a, a one, logical one at the output, you'd have five volts there. So then I defined a, a truth table. I said, okay, uh, a truth table is a table that shows the inputs and the outputs and you list all possible combinations of inputs. Uh, and a good way to do that is to start at zero in binary and just count up until you've filled the inputs with ones. So zero, one, two, three. So that's all possible combinations of inputs. And uh, so the OR gate is defined by this truth table it answers the question, um, are either of my, is either of my inputs true or both? So this would be uh, no, neither input is true. Oops, that's wrong. For the second row, you'd have a one because I've got B true. Here I've got A true. And by the definition of the OR gate, when both inputs are true, the output is true. So this is what this gate does. I'll show you what this is physically. It's, it's a chip and I'll show you how to make it out of transistors. But uh, this, is, this is the major function of that gate. Okay, it's a logical gate. We also define this gate as being a logical addition. Okay, and a logical addition means this. It's written out like this. So C equals A plus B. This plus, it's not like adding voltages, right? It's not five plus five equals 10. It's actually the representation, right? It is the operator that implements this truth table. 
So if A is zero and B is zero, C is zero. If A is one and B is one, C would be one, okay? So it's a, it's a logical expression. It's called Boolean logic, and this is a Boolean expression. Okay, so, uh, so that's what an OR gate does. And we're going to talk about other gates, but this is one of the fundamental gates, one of the fundamental elements that lets you implement combinatorial logic. Okay, so, okay, let's, let's continue on. Let's define more gates. Let's do an AND gate. So this will be an AND gate. An AND gate looks like this. Right, the OR gate's kind of pointed with this curvy input side and the AND gate's round in the front and has a flat input side. So I'll define some variables here, A, B, and C. And again, let's, draw the truth table to show what this gate does, it answers the question, are both of my inputs true? Right? Are, are, they, are they both equal to one? Let me straighten that out a bit. So a truth table, right? Let's do the same thing. Let's list all possible combinations of inputs and write the corresponding output. So a zero anded with zero, right? I'm gonna say these like and and or gates. I'm gonna say ORD and anded. So a zero anded with a zero is a zero. Zero and one, that's a zero. One and zero, that's a zero. One and one, that's a one. So that's, that is what this AND gate implements. Okay, so the only way I get a true or a one at C at the output is to have both inputs true or one. Okay. Uh, this is a logical multiplication. I'll just write logical multiply. So in this case, C equals A times B, so AB. And so whenever you see a logical multiply, right, you know these are logical variables, then you, uh, you substitute that operator, that multiply operator with, uh, with this table here. So all three of these representations of the AND gate mean the same thing. This logical multiply, means this table, right? This schematic symbol, this, this uh, the gate drawing here, means uh, that table there. They all mean the same thing, they're all equivalent. Okay. All right, so let's look uh, at a couple more, a couple few more gates here. Um, let's look at the uh, logical inverter. Okay, so that's a logical inverter. And so that would look something like this. Here's the symbol. It's a triangle with a bubble on the output. And it has one input, one output. Here the output is B. And the truth table would look something like this. Well, there's only one input. and all possible combinations of inputs would be zero and one. And the output would be one for a zero and zero for a one as the input. Okay, so it's taking the logical signal and inverting it. It means it's making it its opposite value. So you could write that out as an expression, B equals A, bar, so that's a bar over the A. That means invert whatever's under it, okay? 
Um, so let's continue on here. Let's talk about the exclusive or. So the exclusive or gate. And so that looks like this. So it's an OR gate, but it has this extra curve um, on the input side. Okay, this is also called an XOR. You'll hear me call this XOR, XOR. So let's put some variables here, A, B, C. And so the truth table here looks like this. My writing a little better there. So the XOR answers the question uh, is either input true, but not both. Okay, so it's a little different than the OR. So either input true, but not both, no. Either input true, but not both, well, yes. Either input true, but not both, yes. Either input true, but not both, no. Right, so you can compare that to the OR gate truth table. It's a little different, okay? This is um, written as an expression like this, C equals A plus with a circle around it, B. Okay, so that's, an exclusive OR, or an XOR. It's also called a modulo to adder. So tuck that little fact away for a little bit. I'll show you later how you can use an exclusive OR gate to create a circuit that adds binary numbers together. Okay, uh, let's see. So the, those are primarily the gates we'll use. I'll add two more here. They're just slight variants of, of what we have here. Um, this, this will be a NAND gate. And NAND means not AND, okay? So an, a NAND gate looks something like this. It has, it looks like an AND gate except on the output, there's a bubble, okay? And so here's A, B, and C. And uh, whenever you see a bubble on an output or even an input, that means to invert that logic variable, right? That's what this is up here, right? Except I'm not drawing the triangle down here, but that bubble means invert. So this is actually equal to an AND gate followed by an inverter, okay? So A, B, and over here on the other side of the inverter is C. And so I could write this as uh, C equals A, B with a bar over it. Okay, the bar is over the, the, mul the whole multiplication, okay? Um, let's see if I can squeeze this in here. Let's do a let's do a NOR gate. You could probably figure out what this is going to be, right? A NOR gate is uh, it looks like an OR gate. That's a horrible OR gate. That's an OR gate, but again, put a bubble on the output. Right. And then that is just an OR gate. With an inverter on the output. Okay, so if I can squeeze this in here, I should draw this like line between here. Uh, C in this case would be equal to 
A or with B with a big bar over the whole expression. Okay. So, so uh, primarily we'll work with the OR gate, the AND gate, the logical inverter, and the exclusive OR, but, but you'll see these. You'll see the NAND gate. You'll see the NOR gate. So you should be able to also work with, work with those. Okay. And, and remember, uh, you know, these are actual circuits. So you can buy a chip and I'll show you uh, a data sheet for one where, you know, let's take an exclusive OR. Uh, this is uh, A would be a pin on the chip, B would be a pin on the chip, so would C. You'd power the chip, and when you apply 5 volts, if it's a 5 volt logic chip, when you apply 5 volts to an input pin, that's a logical 1, and when you apply 0 volts, that's a logical 0, and you read the same voltages for 1 and 0 on the outputs. Okay? Okay, any questions on gates? So these are all the gates, and next we're gonna, I'm gonna erase the board and then go into uh, talking about how to use these and do something useful. Okay. So let's erase all this. Okay, so next let's talk about implementing expressions uh, with, with logic gates. So you're, you're gonna see logic, logical expressions and logical circuits represented in both gates with schematic drawings and logical expressions or, or Boolean expressions. And so let's just do a quick example of that. Okay, so implementation of logical expressions. So let's suppose you have a, a fairly simple expression, right? Let's start out. That's a D equals A plus B inverse times C. Okay, so what this means is I, I have some output D and I'm taking these inputs A, B, and C and you can apply an order of operations here. They're what you would expect from, uh, from algebra, from regular algebra, except maybe the inverter is a little confusing, but I would invert B first. So uh, B would be inverted. Then the multiplication happens right before the addition. So it'd be the inverse of B multiplied by C. Again, that's an AND gate. And, and then that result would be ORed, right, added. Uh, to A, and then you'd get your result D. So, so let's suppose I want to implement this with logic gates, right? You've got, you've got to build a circuit, you have chips on the bench, and you've got to build this. So um, let's start at the output over here. Let's start out with D. So here's D, uh, right, which is, I'll write that again, A ORed with the inverse of B ANDed with C. And so there's a wire, right? There's a wire coming out of the circuit. So the last thing I'm going to do, as I described earlier, is implement the, the OR gate, right? So I have uh, an OR gate. That's the last operation before taking the output. So let's do that. So I'd have an OR gate. Um, and the inputs to that OR gate would be A, um, and the term inverse of B ended with C. Okay, and what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to work back to a point where I have uh, just the inputs, A, B, C. So I want A, B, C over here and somehow get D over here. Well, so I already have uh, an A, so I can bring the A back. 
right? So I'd apply a signal A, five volts or zero volts for five volt logic. That goes right into this OR gate. Now I've got to create this term. So to create that term, I'm going to use an AND gate. So there's an AND gate. Uh, and so now the inputs to the AND gate are going to be B inverse and C. Uh, and so C, here's C coming back. I've got an input C. And I need the inverse of B. So I'll just draw an inverter, and there's B. OK, so you can imagine you can have complicated expressions. We'll get to some more complicated ones eventually. Um, but but if, if, you, if you can have, if you can derive, if you've created some kind of logical expression, you can implement those expressions with gates. You can go buy a chip with um, an OR gate, a chip with an AND gate, a chip with an inverter, and now you have a, uh, a circuit that makes a decision based on three inputs, and the decision output is D, right? One or zero, or five volts or zero volts. So you can make that turn on a motor, or turn on a heater, or turn the starter of a car, or something like that. Okay? All right. So uh, any questions on that? I'm going to erase this. Again, I have limited whiteboard space here. But uh, I'm going to show one more kind of conceptual exercise uh, before I move on to, well, how the heck do you, <laughs> how do you implement something that you have an idea of and you can describe in words and then build a, build a circuit that, that implements that? Okay, so next, let's, let's talk about uh, equ equivalency of logical expressions. So um, I want to show two things here. One is using uh, a truth table to show that expressions uh, can be equivalent, show how to do that. And the other is that, well, uh, expressions can be equivalent. This is what that means. You can have an equation, for example, in algebra, and you could have one form of, of an equation, and maybe I factor a variable out, and I get the same result, but I have, uh, you know, essentially a different equation. Um, let me show you what I mean. So let's do an example here of, of proving an equivalency of an expression with one expression with another. So if I have two expressions, let's prove that this expression All right, so I have that expression and you know, maybe I've come up with this uh, as something I want to implement to turn on some motor and you look at it and you say, well, wait a minute, I don't think I have to pay attention to A. It just seems like we should just have to pay attention to B. The value of B itself would control uh, the output, okay? So, so let's do this. Let's use a truth table to show that this expression is equal to B. Okay, so let's do that. This is another way of using a truth table other than just to define uh, a gate. So a truth table right, has inputs. And then in fact, uh, yeah, let me move this over a little bit. I want to write this big. So a truth table has inputs listed. And then the corresponding outputs. But you can actually use the uh, output side to list intermediate expressions. Okay, here's what I mean. Let's list all possible combinations of inputs. 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. Okay. And so what I want to do now is break this, this expression into terms. 
Okay, so let's do this. Let's first work on this first term here. A ORD with B. And what I'll do is, let's see, let's just write down what the value of A or B is. So here, zero ORD with zero, zero. Zero ORD with one is one. One ORD with zero is one. One ORD with one is one. Okay, so I've, I've figured out what that term would be in this expression. And now let's work on the other terms until we see how A and B cause uh, th this whole left side uh, to, to determine what the value would be out of that left side. Okay, uh, let's continue on. Let's go evaluate the inverse of A. So the inverse of A would be one, one, zero, zero, right? So I'm, I'm just looking at the value of A, I'm inverting it. Okay, uh, let's go on to this term AB. So that term AB uh, is an and, right, between A and B. So this would be zero and zero, zero, zero and one, zero. One and zero, zero, one and one, one. Okay, so I'm just working through all these terms here. Um, so then I can evaluate, let's see, this this whole term here. So I'm gonna say, okay, let's evaluate inverse of A anded with AB. Okay, so now what I'm doing is I'm not looking at the uh, the inputs anymore. I'm looking at these intermediate columns. This, these intermediate columns help me figure out this term. So now I'm oring this column with this column. So let's or those together. I get one or zero, one, one or zero, one, zero or zero, zero, zero or one, one, right? Okay, and so finally, now I have this term, and I can and it with the first term over on the left, the first output term there. And so now I have the whole expression, uh, A ORD with B anded with the quantity A inverse plus AB. Okay, so now I'm working on this first column, and currently the last column, so let's see, let's, Let's and those together. Zero anded with one, that's a zero. One anded with one, that's a one. One anded with zero, it's a zero. One anded with one, that's a one. And that, so that's, that's what the left side becomes. Um, if you were to have inputs, and you apply those inputs, A and B, to a circuit that implements the left side, right, at the output of, of the left side, you would see these values here. And so what we're trying to do here is, well, you know, I, I made the, uh, the comment, well, maybe you say that, hey, I think this, this logically only depends on B. And you would be right, because if you look at this column, right, for all possible combinations of inputs, and then you look at the value of B, uh, they're actually the same, right? So when I have the four different possible combinations of inputs, I get this output. So really, the left side uh, is equivalent to just looking at B, okay? So you really wouldn't need the input A to determine the output of a logic circuit uh, on, on the left here. Okay? Questions on that and any questions on this truth table or how I got, you know, these intermediate terms and then figured out the final term from the intermediate term. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's erase this and let's you know, finally get to something quite useful. So let's suppose you have a, a, a logic in mind. Right? 
you have some inputs in mind. They could be from sensors uh, that give true false outputs. Um, they could be the output of comparators where a voltage is higher or lower than another voltage, right? So in my car example, it could be the, the is the key turned switch, um, you know, to turn the starter? Is the brake pressed? Is the airbag deployed? Let's suppose that you have a bunch of inputs and, and let's just use three now. And let's figure out, well, how do you go from, you know, what's in your head, the logic in your head to building a circuit that does that? And this could be either hardware or software, either way, um, this, this process works. I'll talk about a, li a little bit about that when we get to microcontrollers, but so when you create something out of nothing, right? When you're creating a circuit out of an idea, we, we call that synthesis. So this would be synthesis of logic circuits. So, so let's do this. Let's say you have three inputs. Three inputs, and, and then you have, let's spread that out a bit, and then you have one output, D. And you want, a value of an idea in mind for what D should be for all possible combinations of inputs. So let's let's first list out all the inputs. So again, I it started zero. We did this for two variables, not three, but let's do it for three now. You start at zero and you just count up in binary. If I did this right, I sh for, for three logical inputs, I should have eight rows, and I think I do here. And again, to, so to keep things straight, let me, let me draw some lines here. These lines don't mean anything other than I'm trying to keep my table straight. Okay. Let's see. Okay, so the D column is, is again, what you have in your head. I'm going to make something up here. I'm going to say that, well, when I have, when I have uh, zero, 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 uh, I want the output to be uh, one, okay? And when I have zero, zero, one, I want the output to be zero, right? I'm making this up. This would be whatever you want to happen. You want a motor to spin or you want a motor not to spin based on the values of three digital sensors. Um, so let's let's just continue this, right? Let me just make up some values here. Again, these don't mean anything. I just want to use an example here. So, so we have this table, and we would like to implement this table. Okay, we'd like to make this happen with a circuit. We'd like to synthesize a circuit. Okay, let's talk about two ways to do this. So the first uh, is called the sum of products. So it's the sum of products implementation. So if I were to summarize this, uh, what you do to implement, implement this table, it would be uh, concentrate on the rows for which the output is one, and then make that happen. Let me explain what that is. I think you'll see the definition will make more sense once you know how to do it. Let's concentrate on the output equals one. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is this, I'm going to say D equals a sum of product terms. So here, here's what I mean by that. 
I'm going to have these terms. I'll just draw blank parentheses now. I'm going to have some terms in there um, that are added together, right? It's just they're summed together. And let's, I don't know how many there will be, but let's say there are a bunch. So those terms are added together. That means they're inputs, they are inputs to OR gates or an OR gate or a multi-input OR gate. That means that if any one of the terms in those parentheses is equal to one, then D evaluates to a one, okay, right? In, in the OR truth table, if you had, for any row, if you had a, a one as an input, you got a one as an output. The only time the output was zero was when all of the inputs were zero. Okay, so let me show you how this works. So D uh, will be equal to, let's look at the first row. Let's concentrate on the first row for which the output is one. To make a term, right, this term, for which the output is one, I could do this, A, B, C, and let me draw that bigger. I've got to invert each one of those. I want to make sure that inversion is clear. Okay, so if I invert A, and I invert B, and I invert C, and then I and those together, right? I put them into a three input AND gate where all values have to be true uh, in order for the output to be true. Then this will evaluate to be a one, right? Zero, zero, zero would be a one ANDed with a one ANDed with a one. That gives me a one. And remember, if I can force any one of these terms to be a one, D will equal one. Okay, so I've, I've caused a one to happen for that first row. It turns out if you look at this, if you, if you look at the inputs for any other row, um, at, you know, for example, if any, a, any of the variables A, B, or C is equal to zero, then this term would evaluate to a zero, okay? Um, so let's continue this. So we concentrate on the rows for which the output is one. Uh, let's go to this row, zero, one, zero. How do I make a one happen with, with a product term? Well, I invert A, I leave B alone, and I invert C, right? So for that term, uh, this row of inputs would cause a one to happen when that's ORed with everything else, even if the rest are zeros, D would be one, okay? And continue on. So let's concentrate on, let's see, this row here to make a product term that evaluates to a one, I could say, uh, let's see, I have to leave A alone, leave B alone, and invert C. So that term causes a one to happen for that set of inputs. And finally, for the last row for which the output is one, I just have an ABC term. All right, so if you, if you input, for each row, you input, uh, a set of values into this expression, uh, you would see that D matches what's shown here in the truth table. Okay? Any questions on that? That's, you know, that's kind of a, a weird concept uh, to grasp. Anybody have any questions on that? So there's another way of writing this. You'll see this in your book. It's the, the homework answers and examples have uh, an expression written like this. What, the, what, what sometimes is done is there's an index assigned and it's essentially the binary value of these inputs. And you'll see uh, an expression that looks like this. Uh, D is equal to the sum of what we call min terms. That's a script M. Okay. And so that M 
refers to uh, the function created by these rows over here. And all I do is I insert the value for n for which the output is 1. Okay, so that is a way to express this truth table in a different notation. That's all that is. This means this, okay, when, when these rows are defined as shown in the truth table. Okay, so you'll see this, you'll see this in the book, um, in the answers and uh, for some of the examples. Okay, so that's the sum of products implementation. Let's talk about the product of sums. Okay, uh, this is just another way to implement this table. And in this approach, you're gonna concentrate on the output equaling zero. Okay, and let's see, so, so let's see. Uh, um, so someone asked if you write, if, let's go back to the first example of product of sums. If you write in the second way, this way, right? How do you know, how do you know which uh, input is, is supposed to be inverted? Right. Um, well, what you would have to do is you would actually have to write the truth table out based on that, right? I'd have to write this whole truth table and I'd indicate that D is equal to one for row zero and D is equal to one for row two, right? So that's what you'd have to do. You'd have to actually figure out where to um, put the inverters from the truth table, just like we did to start out with. So it's just, it's another notation of how to describe the truth table, um, but it doesn't give you, uh, it's, it doesn't tell you which inputs directly, which inputs to invert. So for the product of, of sums, we're gonna concentrate on an output equaling zero and we're going to force a zero to happen. Um, so let's, again, uh, I'll explain it and then that definition actually makes more sense after you know how to do it. So I'm going to have these terms that are sums and they're all multiplied together and so remember, this is uh, the function of an AND gate, a, a multiple input AND gate. In order, in order for an output of an AND gate to be a one, I have to have all inputs equal to one. Right? So if I make any one of these terms equal to a zero, then the output is going to be zero. So let's do that. Let's look at this truth table and let's force the output to be a zero. Uh, for the rows for which the output should be zero. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so let's write D equals, all right, let's go down the rows and figure out what's the first row that has an output of zero. Okay, it's this first row. So uh, we have to have a sum term, this is the product of sums, a sum term that forces a zero to happen. So to make a zero happen, I'm gonna do this. I have to leave A alone, leave B alone, and invert C. Okay, remember, I'm trying to make a zero happen. So if I or A for this row, which is zero, B, right, it's zero, ORD with C, which is a one, but I'm inverting it, making it zero. I have zero, ORD with zero, ORD with zero. That gives me a zero. And since I'm multiplying that, I'm anding that with the rest of these terms, uh, the output D is going to be zero. Okay, so, and, and you'll, you'll see that if you apply this term, if you apply the inputs to this term, um, 
you, you'll get a one. You'll get a one for this term for all the rest of the rows. Okay, so let's go down to row three. There's the next row for which the output is zero. So I want a zero to happen out of a sum. So I'm gonna have, let's see, uh, leave A alone, right? invert B, invert C. Okay, and so let's see if I did that right, zero, and then I'm gonna invert B, invert C, and I get a zero. So that term will be a zero for that row. Okay, let's go to uh, row four here. One zero zero. So I have to invert A, leave B alone, leave C alone. Okay, so I've made a zero happen for those inputs, and let's make a zero happen finally for row five here. Uh, let me let me write it down here. So I have to invert A, leave B alone and invert C, okay? So um, this expression, right, you could go from this expression to AND gates and OR gates and inverters. If you built this using logic gates, that would give you the results of this truth table that are defined in this truth table. And remember, this truth table came from, well, your application. You decide for each row, for each combination of inputs, what do you want the output to be, right? You start there, and this is a way to actually implement uh, that truth table in a circuit using AND gates, OR gates, and inverters. Now, you might ask the question, well, uh, is, can you reduce these? Can you use fewer gates? And the answer is yes. There's a way you could actually factor out like some variables here and reduce the number of gates you need. We're not going to talk about that. We're actually just going to uh, leave it here. I would encourage you, if you're interested, you can Google gate reduction of logic circuits. Um, you'll see things like Carnot maps um, and other ways just factoring out variables that would let you reduce the number of gates. But, but what I really wanted to show you here is it's really, it's possible, right? You can come up with a logical expression in your head, right? you decide, and then you can go implement this in electronics or even software, okay? Okay, um, so I wanna add something here uh, onto what we talked about for the product of sums. There's another way to write this equation. You'll see this in the answer key. You'll see it in, in the answers for example problems. Um, you can also write this as D equals the product of what we call max terms. So that's capital Pi there. And so what you do is you say, this is the product of max terms, right? Unlike min terms up here, which, which was a lowercase m, this is max terms. And so it's, it's the product of the max terms that are identified by the index n, and so you're going to list the index as the argument here um, for all the rows for which the output is zero. So I'm going to say this is the product of max terms uh, for, for one and three and four and five. Okay. So that's just another way you'll see of defining this truth table. Um, and, and you'll see that in examples in the book and also solutions. So I just wanted to point that out. All right, so, um, so I guess we've come up on the end of, of class here, of our virtual class. And so uh, I'd say this, so what I'm gonna do is uh, switch over to office hours now. Um, if you have any questions you'd like to ask about this material or any of the other material, then definitely stick around for office hours, or even if you want to, uh, you know, just stick around to listen to other people's uh, questions, that's fine too. And um, if not, you're always welcome to watch this lecture again. Um, and if you can't make a lecture, of course, you can watch the lecture uh, for the first time. So, so keep an eye out for the exam Friday at 4 p.m. 
and see the announcement on Canvas if you haven't seen that yet. And so if you're not going to stick around for office hours, have a good night, be safe, right? And um, I'll see you next time. I hope you can join then. So I'm going to go on mute for a couple minutes. And if you want to stick around, awesome. I'll be back in a few minutes.